when I speak about housing, I sometimes, you know, it's important to situate yourself. So I'll talk a little bit more about my own housing situation and history. So I um, will talk a little bit about co-housing. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about co-housing, but I think there's some things and lessons from what I've learned about co-housing that we can apply to home sharing. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we do have some data I'll share with you about preferences of older adults for home sharing. And because I'm not an expert on home sharing, I thought I would um, go to the literature and see what research has been done about this topic and share with you some of those key findings today. So as I said, I talked to, to a conference, um, I was in Denmark and got to see all kinds of interesting forms of housing. and. This was a conference on people on um, intentional communities or more about communal living. And every time people would come up to me and say, so what kind of interesting community do you live in? And I'd say, I just live in a house. <laughs> I don't live in a, sorry, I don't live in a commune. I don't live in anything really exciting. But I would say that I am from rural, a rural place. I'm from rural Prince Edward Island. And I'm very much know what it's like to live in a community. It's not an intentional community, it's very much an organic community. So small places and the connections between people. So I, I feel like I live in an intentional community, just not one that was um, you know, put together by people on purpose, it just simply was there. Um, so I do live between Nova Scotia and PEI. So I did keep my home in PEI. I don't know why I use a winter scene, maybe just to shock people from hot climates when I talk, but it was just a beautiful picture after a very big storm before I got dug out. <laughs> my house almost got buried that day. And in Halifax, I live in a, it's like my country mouse and a city mouse, I think. The, um, bottom left is the condo building where I have a condo in the north end of Halifax, a very compact, very environmentally friendly, very, very modern building. But it's really neat how we have more than 70 units on this little tiny piece of land in, in north, north end of Halifax. So that's pretty neat. And as David mentioned, I've also been involved in um, um, a seniors assisted living home. So we have about 24 residents in a home in rural PEI that all live together and we do provide some care and support and staff are there 24 hours a day. And I've lived in lots and lots of different types of housing, especially during my student years. Many, many different apartments shared with many, many different roommates and such things over the years. So just really briefly about co-housing. So co-housing um, is a very interesting form of housing where everyone has their own individual type of how, type of their own unit. So, you know, it's like a, either an apartment or a small home, but it's a complete unit with kitchen and bathroom and all of those things. So there has been really interesting initiatives in Canada where, you know, and, and many other places where people have their own living unit, but they do live in an intentional community. So very close to other people where there's a lot of mutual support. So people aren't living in isolation, but there's a lot of people around them. You know your neighbors really well. You do lots and lots of things with your neighbors and support your neighbors. These communities have lots of common indoor and outdoor spaces, much more extensive than you'd find in typical single family dwellings or apartments. There's only, though, about 23 completed communities. And even when, in 2018, there weren't too many added, honestly, in Canada since that time. But there was a group of people here from Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, at that meeting in 2018. Um, and they've been successful, finally, in getting their co-housing community established. And as far as we know, it's the first one in Atlantic Canada. But there's been several other groups who've been trying to establish communities like this. But finding, well, first getting the people together who are interested in this, finding the land, everyone agreeing on where it, they want it to be, what do they want it to look like, just the build process, the financial aspects of this, where there's essentially no public investment in this kind of housing. So it's really just the resources that those people pool together to, to build these communities, basically becoming a housing developer, and on and on and on. And it takes a long time, and often groups aren't successful in navigating that entire process. So as wonderful as this form of housing is, 
we've, um, I don't think it's the solution to addressing housing in the short term because of the length of time and a lot of those challenges that it takes. So this is my little map, as, as current as I know, about where co-housing communities are in Canada. They're often multi-generational with people of all ages living there. There's a few that are seniors only though. Um, so knowing this, and during a sabbatical that I had last year, I thought, well, there's a bit of an anomaly in Canada. There's quite a few in BC and not so many in this part of the country. So I was able to, in conjunction with a different project I was doing in, in BC, was able to learn a lot about co-housing. So we had interviewed lots of people who had been involved in developing co-housing across Canada. So when I had an opportunity um, to be in Vancouver for a while, I basically called them up. I said, I know you have guest rooms because you told us you have guest rooms. This is not a, like a high tourist time. It was November and early December. I said, can I stay with you? <laughs> so my partner and I got to stay in the guest rooms of five communities. Um, they charge a very nominal fee to do this. Usually it's people, that your own friends and family that are staying in these guest rooms. Um, but we had just an incredible experience getting to live in different um, co-housing communities and we visited a few others in the area as well. And we learned a great deal. And these are, are really, really amazing, interesting kinds of communities. We do know that having people living in proximity to each other, knowing each other, supporting each other, has a lot of positive impacts on health. So some studies we know from Europe we know that health is significantly better for older people who live in these communities. There's a lot of positive peer pressure, and I really saw that in action. You know, when you know your neighbors, like you kind of knock on people's doors and say, you know, let's go for a walk, or we're going to, you know, we're having a yoga class in the common room. <clears throat> Why don't you join us? So there's just lots of things going on, and people just really aren't, aren't left out. They also do a lot of common meals together, potlucks or, you know, persons just, you know, are willing to cook meals for the whole group. So there's lots of really wonderful food. They often share food. They often buy in bulk and then share that so it can reduce the cost of good food. So lots of impact there. Um, also, it's really hard to be, you know, isolated in a community like that when everybody knows you. So, you know, there's often early identification if something's going on. Um, lots of people living in these places have health backgrounds and are really good at just sort of letting people know if, if something's going on. So early identification, a very preventative thing. Um, and we know that social support is, an, is associated with enhanced physical and psychological well-being. Um, we also know that there's also positive impacts on our health system. If, you know, if there's early prevention and intervention, then you know, often this can be um, less cost for our health system as a whole. In some cases, um, people can return earlier. So a colleague that was living in one of these communities or is living in one of these communities in BC, said that after a hip surgery, she was able to go home earlier from the hospital because she had this whole network of support around her. And every evening, one of the members of the community would visit her, bring a supper meal to her, check out, check her out, see if she needs anything. Like, that's incredible. And different people every night would come to help her for weeks after she came home from her surgery. That's pretty neat to have that level of support. And that can be, of course, very, very beneficial to health and helping our health services out as well. So I, we did learn that through what I've read and the research we did and our co-housing immersion experience, people work very hard at building these communities. It takes a long time to get them established, but they're wonderful communities for people to live in. They work really hard at managing, um, getting along with each other and all the processes they use to make decisions, as you can imagine. We met several people who had key roles. When we asked people, so what are your roles in this community? One guy said, I facilitate. <laughs> That's all he said. I'm the facilitator <laughs> at meetings. I'm like the mediator. I make sure that, you know, I manage conflict. And that was really interesting to me. You know, lots of other people were in charge of gardens and composting and security and all kinds of interesting roles that they fulfilled for their communities. But looking after how they make decisions and the human parts of it is really, really crucial. 
Um, everyone contributed in different ways according to their interests and abilities. And definitely, I think that there should be more opportunities for people to live in this kind of housing where they know the people around them and there's high levels of mutual support. Basically, they can't be socially isolated in these communities, but there's a lot of barriers to establishing them. So I do think, you know, I do hope there's many more established in Canada, but it's not a great short-term solution that we're kind of living in now because, you know, we have this one in Bridgewater and they tried for years to get that community established. And it was really their third try. You know, things happened along the way and it just didn't happen, but finally everything aligned and they were able to build their community and there's people who are living there now. I don't think everyone has moved in, but they're living um, there now. So as wonderful it is, um, when David asked me to talk about home sharing, I thought, hmm, I, think I need to learn more about, <laughs> about home sharing. So home sharing, you know, as David mentioned, we do have a lot of spaces available in housing in Canada that, that aren't being used. And this is a, something that could be implemented much faster than um, building new communities like co-housing communities because they're usually new builds in Canada. Um, just a little bit of information I was able to glean because I thought, first of all, well, have I learned anything about home sharing along the way? So a long time ago, I was part of this um, seniors housing research study in Atlantic Canada where we surveyed a lot of people 65 and older um, in the region. We also did you know, some focus groups as well with specific groups. So we learned a lot about seniors housing, where people are living and their preferences for the future because the idea was that we need to know what do people want essentially and how will that help to inform us what is developed in the future. So I almost forgot, but you know, we we did collect a little bit of data about about home about home sharing. So we learned a lot about, as I said, kind of what's happening with seeing older people in housing. So we know a lot of people live alone, about one in four in our survey of people 65 and older lived alone. 70% lived in rural places. Again, this was only a survey in Atlantic Canada. 76% lived in a single family home. And when we, when we presented that to people in urban areas, they're like, that's gotta be wrong, like that can't be. But that is, that was the case in our survey in Atlantic Canada. Many, many, many lived in, a, three quarters lived in a single family home. 50% said downsizing was the reason that they planned to move. They had too much space. The place that they have is too much work, too big for them. They were essentially overhoused, which is, a, um, I think that was, if you have, you had a, you get a sticker if you're overhoused. I think that was one of the, the things um, when you registered this morning. 55% um, so over half said they, you know, who wanted to move, said they wanted to stay in their same community. So they didn't want to leave their community. They just wanted to leave the current home that wasn't working for them anymore. It was too big. It was too much work. And 33% said that their ideal living arrangement was really where they're living now, but they might need help to stay there. So I think there's a lot of things that we learned from this survey done a while ago with people 65 and older that really kind of point to the fact that home sharing could answer, could be the answer for many people. So in this survey, we presented people with lots of different potential types of housing and we gave them a definition. This was our definition of home sharing. So we asked them, have you heard of this before and is this something that you would be interested in? So um, we gave them this situation where typically one person owns the home and then other people would rent part of the home from them and they would contribute some things to the person who owns the home. So that was our definition of home sharing. It's not the only definition, but it's the one we gave people. So it was really curious. Again, this is data from a while ago, but 28.7% said that they were aware of it. So that told us that not, it wasn't very commonly known, really. And there's certainly some work to do about well, what is this type of housing. And only 19% said that they might consider this option in the future. So, but you know, with this survey, and we, we gave them so many different options, um, I thought at that time we were going to find like the one thing that all seniors wanted, and that would be wonderful because then we can build that. We didn't find that. We basically found of all these different array of options, 
like home sharing, some preferred this, some preferred that. So it really told me that, you know, we really need a lot more of everything, <laughs> including, including home sharing. So I think there's lots of education that can be done around this. Um, and as, because as more people were aware of options, that seemed correlated with what they consider it. If you were never aware of it, you just learned about it in the survey, you were unlikely to say, yes, I would definitely want that option. So I think some awareness raising can be really helpful. Uh, and another study, this was interviews that we did that was a, were about co-housing. And we found that in Ontario at that time where housing prices were quite high. So these were interviews done in 2018. So at that time, housing was really expensive in Ontario. Since that time, housing has become much more expensive in our part of the world, in, in this region. So um, we did find that there were different communities that called themselves co-housing. They didn't fit our model of co-housing, the definition of the Canadian co-housing network. Um, but so I never really talked much about them. But when I thought about these interviews we did, these few, we didn't, as I said, they didn't fit our definition of co-housing. But they were like a type of home sharing, really, where in all of these three examples, um, they were co oh, I don't, this, this, I made this, this phrase up, co-ownership home sharing, where people co-own a home together. So the cost of their housing is lower than if one person owned it alone. All the people share the costs of living in that home and they share the common spaces. So there's not a separate independent living space with your own kitchen and bathroom necessarily. You have a bedroom and maybe your own bathroom and then you share the rest of the home. So it is home sharing in that way. These ones in particular were ownership models um, versus one person owning it and then renting space to other people. But um, I don't know how common this is in, in the Atlantic region in Canada, but in Ontario, this was gaining some traction at that time. And there were some organizations really trying to promote the development of this. So um, I think it's a really interesting model that certainly provides a lot of financial, there's a lot of financial benefits and a lot of um, social connection. And most of them incorporated ways of adding caregivers are already had ways to have caregivers supporting the people living in these homes. So uh, another model of home sharing where multiple people own the same home. So I'd also looked around to see, well, you know, what structure is there around home sharing? So I did find that there's a home share international. Uh, so this is just a, a screen capture of the website. Um, so there is a national or international body. Um, they listed Home Share Canada. So this is a structure in Canada that supports home sharing. And you can see on the right there was different branches or different provinces. Um, across the country, including in Nova Scotia. So there's some kind of organization in Canada to support home sharing. Um, but as I said, I don't have a lot of research evidence on, on home sharing that I've done. So I really thought it would be helpful to go to the literature and see what do we know from published research and published um, articles on home sharing. So I'm just going to share a few with you. And there's not a huge amount of research on this topic, I would say, as a whole. So I focused specifically on, I, start, I first just looked at the body of literature. And this concept of intergenerational home sharing did seem to have some traction. This was an area that there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in. So I would probably describe this as the older person owns a home. They're often living alone. And they want to have younger people um, students or young people working in the area um, come to stay with them and maybe pay some rent or contribute to the home. So I learned from doing some reading on the topic that this concept of student senior home sharing originated in Spain in the mid-90s, which is interesting. A lot of these models seem to come from, from Europe. Um, we There's sort of this um, idea that baby boomers are really might be much more likely than people who are older than them to seek out these types of housing. Um, so in France, um, they, this article was specifically about the importance of having an organization to help to facilitate the match, vetting people, 
if there's any conflict that happens, that there's an organization beyond just the, the people in the home to, to help to navigate that and to manage that. So that's what I really took from, from this article, is that having that third party organization is really important to facilitate home sharing um, arrangements. It could be done very informally, individually, but I think I see the advantages of having that kind of organizational structure. Um, a problem with this study was they identified that um, it seemed that there was more young people that were interested in this than older people who <laughs> were willing to have people share their home. So that's certainly something to, to think about. Um, there is a, not a lot of research yet on what the outcomes of these types of arrangements might be, but some expected outcomes are, of course, enhanced affordability, both for the young people, but also income for older people as well, if, they're, if, they're paying, if the younger people are paying some rent. It's expected that there would be positive effects on psychological health, increased feelings of security, independence, um, companionship, and reduced loneliness. Um, also, I think really importantly, any initiatives where we can bring people together across generations, bringing older and younger people together, is good for our society. You know, I find when I work with young students who've not really had much contact with older people, they often have some really weird ideas about older people and often are quite discriminatory <laughs> against older people, but more connection between generations, I think, is a, a good thing. Um, right now, universities are really motivated to help, find, help their students find housing. So this is a kind of a very timely topic that universities might really be interested in helping out. And, might possibly be that third party organization in a way, helping to do that match and, and such things. Um, one suggestion in this article was that maybe there could be tax incentives for property owners who were willing to do this type of thing. So I thought that was something interesting that could be considered. <clears throat> so this, this um, was a study um, in the United States and Northeastern states. Um, but why do older people um, do this. So they interviewed a small number of people who were engaged in these third-party arranged home sharing agreements and um, they really identified some, I think, important things. So for the older people, they really liked to have that companionship. It helped fe having feeling more secure having other people living in the home. It can help them with finances. It can be in, um, cheaper than having home care or people coming in to help provide support for you. They seem to appreciate working with, the, again, these third-party organizations versus, uh, you know, having an official renter where you have a tenant, you know. So there's sort of different legal things around renting to a tenant versus a home share agreement that's supported by a third-party organization. So they did seem more interested in that than officially renting um, to a tenant kind of thing. So um, there certainly are lots of things that older people, what reasons why older people would be interested in this, and also some caveats as well. So I think I'm almost out of time, but I did find um, one very recent study <laughs> that's published online. It's um, very hot off the presses. So um, this is a study about Canadian students and really why would they be interested in it? So from the other side, why would students want to do this? So there has, there does, um, there is some work already in Canada. I found some evidence at McMaster and also universities in Toronto that have been trying to do this. So they did a survey of students at Queen's University and it was interesting to me that they just sent it to graduate students. They kind of felt that graduate students, by definition, are a little bit older. They might have been, you know, living in other contexts in the world. And um, instead of, you know, sending it to 18-year-olds, these were probably students that were a bit older. Um, so they found that you know, quite a few people were interested. Not all students, obviously, but they said they found that 13% were very interested, 32% moderately interested, um, and but they many felt that the university itself should be doing something to help support this model. The ones that were the students that were most interested in this um, had past experiences working or volunteering with seniors. 
They weren't very happy with where they were currently living. They often had a lot of roommates and they weren't paying a whole lot of money. And what that basically means is that they were probably pretty low income seniors who were looking for an affordable, affordable home <laughs> that wasn't as chaotic perhaps as living with a whole bunch of other students. They felt that you know this would be lower cost for them. They would gain new perspectives and have better living conditions if they lived in a home share agreement. Um, some of them had concerns about, you know, would I have less privacy, you know, if I lived in a home sharing agreement. Um, that was kind of the, the main issue that they identified. So I think we've learned a little bit about home sharing um, in our research, a small amount, but there certainly is some, a little bit of research out there, especially around intergenerational home sharing and how this can be of benefit to older people and younger people. So it really seems to me like um, quite a win-win situation, not for all young people and not for all older people, but a really important area that I think um, can be implemented very quickly, which I think is really important today. So I'm probably out of time now, so thank you very much for listening, and I'm really looking forward to listening to everyone else and all the discussions and the rest of the day. So thank you for having me.